First of all, wel welcome everyone. Um, hi, I'm Anna Arizon, Editor-in-Chief for Battery Journal. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to the first event in our launch series for Universe Poetry Prints Proofs by Visionary Humans. I'm honored to have many of the artists from our book joining us today to present their work in celebration. With this book, we have created a tool for opening up a generative synaptic space for engagement, both physical and phenomenological, with the interstitial experiences of aural, visual, and verbal activity. The result is a synergistic connection between the left and right sides of the brain, creating new pathways. Our book presents a new genre we are calling artem poesis, derived from artem, Latin, meaning art, skill as a result of learning and practice, and poesis, Greek, meaning poetry, to make an action that transforms, bringing forth a threshold occasion, a moment of ecstasis when something or some things become another. This book is devoted to the work of 82 contemporary poets and visual artists, the artists chosen for this book create an intersectional, multi-generational poesis from David Ferry, who is 96, to Grace McNair, 31. We even have a lovely poetic sunflower pollen painting for the bees created by our youngest artist, Adelaide Holden, who is seven years old. These unique voices honed at different times all speak to us of the complexity, beauty, and struggle in, intrinsic to our human condition. In times of crisis, art provides philosophical and spiritual insights, catharsis, and healing. Art possesses the power to capture the full range of human experience, from the rich, revelatory textures of daily life, to the horrors of war and pandemics, to the ecstasy of transcendent love. Our vision behind this collection of work by these superlative poets and visual artists is to present work that is both deeply enmeshed in the specificity of history, and at the same time, an enduring, crucial human constant. The unifying principle organizing this anthology is relational order theory, a methodology which presents a context for all existing systems, matter, and space-time to be considered as a relational whole. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And Jennifer Levy, take it away. Yes. Okay. So first, we're going to see the work of Patrick Marr. Uh, I'm going to set that up right now. Patrick, would you like to talk about your work or read? Uh, sure. Uh, this is an intro. Um, like, I don't think of myself as a poet. Um, like, I occasionally get woken up in the morning by words and I write them down. And sometimes I talk them into a uh, recorder and go to go back to sleep. But um, it's been it's been many years. I mean, I've always been writing poetry since I was a teenager. Um, and I didn't really know what to do with it recently. Um, started combining it with, with, with photo collages. And, um, and these are from a residency that I did upstate um, where I was in nature for a few days and starting to commune with nature. Um, so there's two selections, um, but they were generally about things that were sort of annoying in nature from a, from a city, city person point of view and somehow kind of reconciling that um, antipathy and, and turning it around into a kind of deeper sense of connection. So, um, should I read, read the poems? Sure. Okay, um, so first one is Toad Ponder. By the waterside, this isn't a high, this is a hello. There's no come down. There is though a come up. There'll be come by, say hi, I and I. One, oh, 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 um. Um, mm, oh. Nice. Dithering, what if all the flies about were not randomly buzzing around, but greeting old friends, kissing ghosts and making apologies, righting wrongs to spirits they had known, loved and slighted in other lives for the span of a few days, 
these weekend parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was good to hear you read them. I've read them before. They sound different when I read them. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Your voice and your presence here today. Thanks, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Stay, stay here. Stay with us. Hang out. It's more fun to be had, I guarantee. Okay, so next is Heather Dubrow. Dubrow. Nice. Um, whichever poem you'd like me to put up, I'm happy to do it. Let's leave boarding calls off. What do you have there? That's what I'll be reading. First of all, I am pleased and honored to be part of this collection. And since I'm one of the first participants speaking, let me stress that I know I talk to everybody. Thank you to the people who helped make this possible. Wonderful work. We're grateful to you. The collection involves juxtaposing and bridging the verbal and the visual. So I chose to read a poem that isn't directly about art, but also builds bridging. A lot of the poems in my new book bridge by taking words from everyday life, a sign in CVS, a couple of words on a building that's going up, something in the train station, and turn, overturn, return to, play with those words. So this one is called Boarding Calls, and it plays on the words that I found in an airport. All passengers must control their poems. I'm sorry, that's interesting. All passengers must control their bags at all times. Look, here's my boarding pass right here and a passport documenting everywhere I've been. I am all passengers from back there to tomorrow. But will let, they let me board when I am hoarding memories in a bag much too big for the carry-on rules? Must control? Give me a break. I wrote the book on it. Is it for New York? Cornell University Press, 1970. I'm into controlling the most mischievous of erroneous endnotes, the settings on my upscale coffee machine, the endings of my gazelles. I am monarch of witty puns. My 14 year old no longer green streaks her hair. And I control fantasy until it turns couplet. But memory has legs, and this bag has legs, dashing out of line in the airport, diving from the overhead compartment right onto my crown. Control must. I need to fly from the mappings. This is the mastery of tomorrow by what happened yesterday. I, not they, will master must, fasten a seatbelt, and arrange a smooth landing. But at all times, makeup does wonder for the bags under my eyes, though not for the dreams that cause them. Thanks to therapy and poetry, I no longer pack heat for the roasts and boils at family and even bag and mouth shut during Thanksgiving toast. I can control my baggage in conversation with my children, most conversations anyway. And I can turn bagger to joke. What a wag she is. But at all times, no, not during the midnight turbulence, not during the midnight roaming and not when we land back home in back there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Catherine will talk about the art Well no, this is not my art, so I don't really know. I don't okay. have it's Rosaire. Where, where now I've lost the screen share. Rosary Appel. That's right. I'm uh, you took the screen share away. Okay, so it's just that Rosaire, the only thing about Rosaire Pellas in general 
is that her whole project is called Asemic Writing. And she has all sorts of, she used to be a, a novelist and she has all sorts of ways of, is sort of making things have a writer-like ad aspect, but are not, have no words. And so because she playing around with that, I thought it would go well with Heather's playful pun ridden word games of poems, which we all enjoyed. Absolutely, it looked like railroad tracks to me. Yeah, that like one, yeah. She didn't uh, respond, so I don't know what if she's not on. Okay, so next is Martha Collins. This is an image that she asked me to put up. The short poem I'll read is from Because What Else Could I Do, a series of poems I addressed to my husband, Ted, following his sudden death four years ago. The poem is based on work by the Colombian artist Doris Salcedo, a series of shirts crafted from sewing needles and silk thread, which she dedicated to the memory of young men killed by violence in Chicago. One of these pieces you're looking at appears on the cover of my book, and the poem interpolates fragments of statements by the artist concerning the series. This poem, like others in the book, is untitled. I want to make you, oh, am I muted? No. No. I want to make you a morning shirt, a beautiful thing like the artist made for the murdered young men. But this would be for me, for us, with traces of lost thread by thread, not to manage grief, but needle by needle inserted bra in the center of our lives to appear and disappear, the absence almost within, but not to touch. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. So next is Michael Holden. One moment. Let's do the two colorful ones, right? Okay. Um, so these are a little bit older paintings. Um, this one was a part of this series. Oh, first of all, I do want to congratulate um, Anna, Catherine, and Jennifer for their achievement of putting this book together. Um, not only is it a nice uh, presentation, but it's also uh, great always to champion our own culture and our own involvement and collectively to learn from each other uh, to, to recognize that. So thank you. So uh, this was a, a series of four paintings. Um, it was uh, life, or it was birth, this is birth, <laughs> and then and there was one that accompanied it, death, and then a, a male and a female. Um, so as far as birth is concerned, uh, it's, it's somewhat of a odalisque uh, female form, which is kind of the vessel of and then from the left hand side it's also kind of an infinite form and from the left hand side to the right hand side it goes from somewhat of a figurative to uh, atomic uh, um, passageway 
So there's also a kind of a, a male, female, left and right, and balancing those two, uh, maybe life and death on the left and right as well. Um, so that would be that one. And uh, this one, uh, previous to this, I painted this uh, eight painting octagon uh, called the creation cycle. And so to follow that, I kind of thought I had to map out some idea of the universe. And so it, symbolically how, how to do that. And so I just uh, referred to a circus tent and kind of a multi perspective perspective. So you're kind of inside the tent and outside the tent and the tent, the, the floor of the tent becomes a desert, desert floor. Um, and then there's a tent inside the tent, maybe a, a, a f fire pit and the ground gives away ultimately. Um, so there is an established gravity and an anti-gravity and then um, outside of it. And it, it's meant to touch upon a sense of representation but yet the forms and the numbers um, are supposed to be uh, simple enough that they could be read uh, completely abstractly like the uh, one zero zero one or, or the eights um, or the ladders or the speaker in the um, upper left hand corner just in just basic formal properties. So that's that, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, next is uh, George Caligaris. Jennifer, one thing I'd like to say, um, do people know that if you go up above your icon, you can click, uh, there's a bunch of little squares and if you go way over to the far left, you can click on hide thumbnail videos and then you can see the full image. It's not blocked by this uh, sort of ladder. Oh, what do you do? Yeah, I didn't know that. I, I'm just telling people because they probably they may only see a cut off image, but if you just go up and click on hide thumbnail video, you can get rid of this, all of our faces just for the duration of the talk, the presentation. Then you can go back up there and click back on the one that has all our faces, which is the second to the far it's the third one from the left I don't know that's helpful know. okay um george do you want me to start or do you want to start uh, why don't you go ahead catherine okay um and jen you could scroll through and just show a range of these pieces but then get back to this one okay I'll, I'll make a general statement about all this work and then i'll just talk about that one so you don't have to show them all but just a couple um, so everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Uh, so for the last few years, one of my art processes has been casting in glass oil cans that I get on eBay for like $2.45 or whatever. Um, and these, so there's a whole bunch of different shapes and this is, a few of them are on this accompanying George's poems. Um, they. I think of them, they have many, many associations for me anyway. And of course, one is oil, which was bad. So I called this big oil and their little oil can. I mean, I called this little oil as a reference to big oil. Um, and also then a friend of mine referred to them as small oils. And I realized they could be about oil painting. And that's kind of funny. Like, would you like to come and see my small oils and then show them actual little oils? Um, but in, in the case of George, and so there are many other things. I'll leave it to you. There, people have had all sorts of associations with them. But in the case of George's poems, now you could go back up, Jen, to the one he's going to read, I think, the, with the um, Abacos. Yeah, uh, this is just such a beautiful photograph, not by me. It was by Denise Frega at a show I was in. Um, 
But I thought of all of these, they're vintage, they're sort of pre-digital, they're from this in the industrial age. Uh, whatever you think of oil, this isn't crude oil, these are oils for you know lubricating things. And every one of those shapes, Jen just showed you a couple of them, was for a specific, I mean, they're altered because I play around with the shapes, but they're based on, every oil can is different that I've done. I've done about 90 of them. And they're all for a purpose. There's a specific purpose to that shape. And it's sort of this wonderful industrial age where gizmos had so much personality and individuality. So in the case of George's poem, um, I was just thinking, uh, George used the word talismanic. I, I just think of it as an example of the kind of, um, the sort of, as some sort of a small object from a lost era that might have been left behind when you had to flee your house because of bombing or because of an invasion, which is George's grandparent, grandmother's story, and um, is only, and so this object, which may have had only personal meaning or may have been, uh, be beautiful in its own right or not, but it's something that was left behind that's very sort of small and humble and only exists in memory or in photograph as a connection back to this lost world. So that's what motivated me to put these on with George's poems. Since uh, David Ferry's name was mentioned earlier, I just wanted to say that he sends his regrets um, his macular degeneration makes it uh, very difficult for him to use Zoom. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this collection and especially to have my work paired with my longtime friend, Catherine Jackson. Um, Catherine said a little bit about this, uh, but my father was born in a tiny village in Arcadia, uh, way up in the Peloponnese. Uh, he came to America just before the start of the Second World War, uh, which eventually found its way to that tiny village. And this poem is called Akubos from a Drone. It's only when I open up the attachment that I see it as seen from above the clouds. My father's village, way up in the Peloponnese, Olympian email sent to me by my cousin, Perry, Pericle Pericles Christopoulos. Stucco houses clustered against the cliff, terracotta rooftops bright as pistachio nuts, and that sugar cube at the very peak. It must be tiny St. George, Akuvos, with its olive groves aglow Akuvos, as seen by the eagle of Zeus. Akuvos, as photographed from a drone. But nothing like that snapshot I saw as a child. Whenever I entered our parlor, where it was always Akuvos up close, but not in color, circa 1940. For all I knew, it was all in black and staring back at me from under the hood of her shawl. I mean that village grandmother I never met, but there she was, ancestral shade with one hand over her heart and lo, in the valley of the shadow of our empty parlor, I saw it, the voice of silent lamentation Akuvos from a drone. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Tina Kelly. Tina, is there a, is there a certain poem you would like to read? Yes, sorry about that. I couldn't find unmute. Um, I'd like to read, there's a stillness, there's a dance in stillness and a stillness in dance. And I have that up where I can read it and you'll put the artwork up, is that right? Yes, it should be there. Yes. Awesome. 
Um, hold on a second. Here we go. Um, the epigraph is from whirlingdervish.org. There is a school in the Catskills where you can learn to be a whirling dervish and it is on um, my bucket list. There is a dance in stillness and a stillness in dance. I adore biking at night, floating and slipping, sliding and traction, the ground invisible, roads lit only by bedroom windows. Something sexy about the cello, wavering note, wiggling finger creating vibrato, there, right there, the human voice in wood, wire, and hair. Is it sweet or savory? Sea salt in chocolate. The hot fuel, rueful light around a mirage. There or no? Yes, there. Is that first spring smell, wild animal marking or twin flower blooming the first of the year? Gather into one things earthly and heavenly, waver in truth and questions, liking and loving in equal measure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Nikki Lent. Nikki, is there, is there a particular image you would like to talk about? Um, maybe if, um, if you could slowly go through all three, I'm gonna be talking more about the project than the individual pieces. Sure. Okay, um, so this is an ongoing series um, that illuminates um, permafrost thaw um, within the Northern, Ala Northern Alaskan landscape. Um, I've been going up there. Um, I couldn't go this spring, but the two springs before I have, um, and I've met with permafrost scientists at the permafrost lab and the Tulik Field Station. Um, so they've been taking me around and um, showing me how to read the landscape and kind of understand and see what effects um, this is having on the landscape. Um, and there's sort of a duality that I've been trying to that that I've been trying to get into the work and work with, which is um uh sort of the how incredibly um uh on the one side devastating it is to see those changes on the other side um the beauty of the and the inspiration of the life force that counteracts it um which is a very strange feeling those two feelings at once um to experience um so that uh, i've definitely been working with bringing that into the work That's really great. Thank you so much, Nikki. I just wanted to point out to those of you who were not here yesterday, which is most of you, that Grace McNair read yesterday. So that's why she's not accompanying the images. But I think they're, it's fascinating to hear about them just in and of themselves. And when you guys get the book, you can connect. And Nikki, I really look forward to hearing more about this ongoing project. And the paintings are just really beautiful. I, I really adore them. Thank you. Thank you, Th and thank you for including me. It's a this is a fantastic project. It's oh, really impressive! It's an honor to have you as a part of this project. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next is Gail Mazur. Gail, are you there? There you are. There. I'm uh, going to read this one poem more and more, which has been paired with an etching and aquatint of my husband, Michael Mazers. And um, I just, uh, Michael always worked in series, partly because he was the most restless and inventive person I've ever known. So there were actually six pond edge etching and aquatints in this series. And this, I don't know if you can see it, but let's see. This 
a little bit higher. It, I, I can't get, they can't get a good enough image of it, right? Uh, anyway, um, these were done in the late, I wonder if I held it in front of my face. Yes, this one. <laughs> But but this is this is beautifully reproduced. So um, anyway, he did this in the late um, in the early aughts of this of the twentieth century, and um, the poem actually that I'm going to read more and more is really um, it's a late summer poem, and it's sort of about the hunger hunger for. And the teeming of life in a in a body of water, and which wasn't actually a pond but salt water, and it's it's also in my book, which has a painting that seems related to to this etching. More, 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 more. The bird me trills. More, more. The surf growls. And more, more, the mud snail thinks, also the succulent scallop, unsafe in its corrugated case. No, no, more goes the blue crab swimming in the tidal creek. Too late, too late, more, more, the god gull shrieks, swooping down to tear at the tender shell. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Gail, would you like to read another one? That one is so short. Yeah. Um, well, the other one that's in the issue isn't that short. Okay. Can I do that? Please do. Okay. Um, and this is also, um, it's addressed to my husband and I'll just say that we married very young. <laughs> um, and we came from two sort of typical and very different Jewish families are, you know, our, our parents were all first generation American Jews. My American poem. Your uncle was a Trotskyist, mine a Stalinist. We'd idealized them as we grew up, although or because they made our parents uneasy, apprehensive. When we fell in love only a few years after the McCarthy hearings, we were so ignorant, we thought our uncles would like to meet. In Washington, where Alan worked for state, the senator from Wisconsin shattered my uncle's life. That was Senator McCarthy. Online recently, I found the photos of him testifying or refusing to, I don't know, the captains didn't say, the captions didn't say, your Harold loathed Stalin, who had Trotsky murdered, lost his faith in Mao and communism, and gained the world. During the war, he was the Newsweek correspondent on the Burma Trail. Mine somehow clung for a long time to his belief in the Red Czar and did not gain the world. He was a good man, funny, loving, a reader. During the hearings, Daily newspapers had to, be, had to be hidden from my grandmother who fled the Cossacks. For a time, her fear was the family atmosphere. Humane, musical, brilliant. Having been entrapped, before he died, Alan was gladdened by Glasnost. Both of them must have liked that we idealized them. Our cousin surely took their parents' heroism for granted. Mine loved that I wrote poetry. He read poems. He liked talking with me about poems, but he didn't really want to hear about Ostrich Mandelstam, didn't believe hope against hope or hope abandoned. A single death is a tragedy. A million death is a statistic. Joseph Stalin. Yours became a China hand, a professor, and had a swimming pool. During Vietnam, he was disgusted by our anti-war Michigas. His first book was called The Tragedy of the Chinese Revolution. His second, No Peace for Asia. You were a punter from your first clutch of words. At 12, you presented your parents with the book you'd written, No Peace for Mazer. Trotsky wrote an enthusiastic preface to tragedy. 
though in the later revised edition, the preface was cut. They both loved poetry, yours to write it, mine to read it. He was proud of me. He made that clear. One Thanksgiving, my brother at the piano and Alan on flute played green sleeves. What have you learned? What do you know? He'd ask whenever we talked. Usually I was speechless, sure he'd be disappointed in me. When King was murdered, we called my uncle to help the black GE workers. Their union had been denied the right to take the day off for the funeral. He won it for them. It took some years after we married, when I'd grown up and read history, for me to realize if Alan and Harold hadn't managed to not meet at our wedding or ever, they'd have been mortal enemies. But that's what we wanted then, for our heroes to meet. That's how little we knew. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really grateful. Yeah. So, so relevant too, culturally relevant right now, I feel this climate of fear you're talking about in the poem. Yeah. Yes. Next is David Rich. Are there any that you would like me to put up on the screen, something in particular? Okay. This is inextricable configuration grouping together, locking in, setting up a spatial structure that shifts as implied connections and ghost images assert an alternate read. Uh, this dusk, this kind of luminosity of dusk is intended uh, to be of use as a visual situation, uh, just work to be with uh, that does not tell the viewer what to think, but hopefully allows or provokes a specific train of thought. Uh, sort of abstract painting as a kind of uh, contemplation device. Uh, there's Two more if you want to see the others. Yes, please. OK. This one is call and response, uh, rooted in a darkly luminous evening light, the neighborhood. Um, wait a second. I had some notes, and I want to find the right ones for this one. I'm not going to find them. I'll just say it. Okay, so call and response is about a kind of interdependent dialogue, sort of like layers of voicings musically that are very open-ended and free. The different voicings are not at all like each other, but they are talking to each other. And there's a certain life-giving honesty that is required of us to participate in this. That's how I think about it. Um, and then there's one more. This one is convex in verse and it's rooted in a couple of little tiny convex mirrors that my friend had on his old uh, scooter. And we would stand around and talk and I'd be kind of seeing the space that we're in, but then also the little reflected light in these little convex mirrors that sort of pick up on the evening, you know, late afternoon light to the west that's kind of like behind us. And uh, just a, uh, the playfulness of that curved space I think of it as a way of 
again, feeling an open-ended dialogue between what is before us and what is behind us as an aid toward uh, being present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is Greg Slick and Greg and Sean Monagle wanted to present together or um, one after the other. So I put up uh, Greg Slick's art and feel free to talk together or one at a time. Hi, I'll, I'll start. Uh, first off, uh, I just wanna thank Battery Journal for including Sean and myself in this amazing anthology. And it's really, you know, it's such an honor to be in the company of so many uh, creative minds. Uh, this work, these images and Sean's poetry have a backstory. It all started with a conversation that uh, Paulette Myers Rich of uh, Traffic Street Press, Sean and myself had been having for a while about the erosion of workers' rights uh, since the late 19th century. All of those advances, you know, basically have been eroded by uh, the corporate world. And we just, you know, we wanted to create something and, and pose a few questions and ask people, uh, the hand that feeds you, you know, does it treat you with dignity? Does it uh, pay you fairly? Does it, um, you know, uh, discriminate along gender uh, you know, sexual orientation, race lines, religion, and basically, you know, pose the question is, uh, you know, maybe that hand needs biting. And I think that this, that what we did here is about biting the hand. Um, all of this culminated in, uh, in a project uh, called Manos Sufias, which is an artist's book uh, collaboration between uh, Paulette Myers Rich, uh, Sean and myself, and beyond that project, there were more poems were written, more works on paper were created, some of which are here. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit about the imagery. Um, these are uh, mixed media works on paper. So there's, there's charcoal, uh, ink, and uh, gouache, and photo transfer on paper. Uh, these images were inspired by a couple of memories, one of which was uh, of my father who worked in a factory and uh, he would come home with busted up hands, uh, dirt that was so uh, worked into the creases of his hands that he could never get them clean. And uh, also memories of um, the transition to, uh, in Spain, the transition to democracy in the 1970s after the death of Franco. Uh, there were a lot of uh, new, you know, uh, political parties, some old ones that, you know, were suddenly, you know, free to uh, run in elections. And a lot of these parties had power fists or, or variations of that. So I became very interested in the iconography of, of hands. So that is basically it for me. And then I will let Sean take it away. Thanks, Greg. I would like to read um, uh, Triumph of the Will, which is on the page above there. The next one, that's right. Um, there is a, a quality, th this, this poem has a kind of a, um, quality that uh, I, I was searching for a poem to wrap up the, the um, <clears throat> one to complete series that Greg, Paulette, and I were contemplating, Monosuthias. And um, I wrote this in about a day. It just came quickly under pressure. And there is a quality that I think, it's a quality that may show up in, 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 the, in my reading. Um, one of the things that inspired me was a comment by Milos years ago when he objected to the way that um, nature shows constantly made parallels to human behavior in societies. And something behind that comment came back to me at that moment and I thought about ants. So this has been 
this has come to be known as my ant poem. Um, so there's a parallel when we talk about ants, uh, we of course are really talking mostly about ourselves because we're trying to draw parallels. So the voice here is uh, different from that of the other poems in the Manoslusia series. And the title, I think, um, gives you a hint of the, um, of the appeal that this speaker is making. Triumph of the will. The lore about ants, their industry, their intelligence, their social organization, their ferocity inspires us corroborates our insights about ourselves. AU social, ants cooperate at the highest levels of sociality, care for the brood of any progenitor and progenitrix of the colony, in defense are loyal unto death, even by self-immolation, against any interloper of another species unless he's there to mate and exudes the pheromones to prove it. They are colonizers of the globe par excellence, thriving in colonies ranging from a few dozen inhabitants to megalopolises of millions in feet deep tunnels on every continent except Antarctica and certain distant islands or cold land masses where nothing grows. On the basis of instinct, labor is divided. Tasks are apportioned to members of their respective castes, assuring the stability of the hierarchy. A single member of the lowest caste, for instance, can carry up to 20 times its weight, and often does. In observance of the laws of nature, economics, and the social sciences, many ants are relieved to the, of the obligation to reproduce, a chore left to the few whom the many serve. They communicate most directly with one another through sound or touch or the above mentioned pheromones. Through evolution, the ant's sting has receded in favor of the mandible with which it can sunder the thorax of the enemy while its mate pin it to the ground. This as necessary to secure its safety and that of the colony or species in all conditions and circumstances against all comer. On and on we cultivate the feckin' parallels. We martyrs of the enterprise. Uh, I too would like to thank uh, Anna, Catherine and um, Jennifer for their wonderful work on this volume. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Next is Monika Sosnowski. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 So hi everybody. Uh, it's good to it's good to see Anna, Jennifer, Catherine, again, I was participating yesterday and um, I loved it so much. I rearranged my schedule for today to uh, come back and, and participate again, um, only if to really find out more um, about the other participants in this amazing um, anthology to see your work and uh, hear you um, read your poems. So this, this has been just a delight. Um, and thank you again to the three of you, uh, the three muses <laughs> um, for, for creating this, for really uh, creating this book, creating this space, creating this event, and then planning um, all sorts of other related events. This is really just phenomenal. So thank you. Um, I'm not paired with a poet or a poem, um, but it's interesting because as I've mentioned yesterday, I think of my photographic work um, as these visual poems and uh, in my work, I contemplate the nature of being in time and place. Um, I'm interested in the intricacies of perception and the response to a given phenomena as it is being experienced. Um, and that's why there's a lot of uh, usually light things happening, uh, reflections, shadows, 
you know, these, these moments when everything just comes together. My subject matter is the everyday and the everyday wonder that's evoked uh, through this combination, often of landscape, still life, and um, portraiture. Um, themes of the fleeting, fickleness of memory, loss, patterns of chance, the uh, possibilities of fate as well as faith, and references to a fragmented self echo throughout. Desiring coherence, I look for traces, presence and absence, and absence and presence, the in-between, and the mystery it reveals. And just as an end note, the two images of mine that were chosen are sort of really touching because they go from um, this daughter of a friend who is a writer to my aunt whom I just met about six or seven years ago for the first time. Um, so I love that you combined this, this, this imaginary and real time sort of um, or passing of time suggested and kind of the reflection on everything that happens within it. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, the reason why there's no poetry accompanying these is that we thought of these as poetry. Some, <laughs> some of the art seemed to be both, so we didn't. Hey, that, that worked out great, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next is Jenya uh, Churvaskia. Yeah. Excuse me. Jenya, you're up. Um, hello, thank you. Um, it's Turovskaya. I know it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. And it's really an honor to be in such extraordinary company um, and to have a space in which to gather during this time when, when we're so missing that um, aspect of our humanity. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful project. I uh, can't wait to actually hold it in my hands and leaf through it in the, in the physical form. Um, I am going to read from um, my uh, poem, which is part of my new manuscript called Enter Ghost. It's, um, it's an excerpt from a serial poem that's about um, 30 or so sections long um, at the time of this reading. And it may stay as it is, or it may expand. I tend to write in the serial form and often a poem can, can build um, over a period of time, sometimes, sometimes years. Um, and, you know, this poem combines um, my interest in, um, I'm also a psychotherapist, psychoanalytic psychotherapist. So uh, there are aspects of, of that. There's physics um, and some of the subjects that were men mentioned along the way, like being a carbon-based life form um, and being a body and uh, thresholds and crossings. So I'll, I'll, I'll read now. I'll pause between the, the sections. From Enter Ghost. Enter Ghost into your contractual obligations, your obligatory forms. Enter the condition of the afterlife. Be coalesced equivocally to enter into the grace of pure bewilderment, sentence sentience, all those necessary or unnecessary angels, the brute or better 
angels of our nature, the domesticated angels, defanged, declawed, denatured, heavy and flightless birds. Disintegrating, I have gathered the integers of myself, have walked hand in hand, arm in arm with myself through the world, slept with and curled into myself so often, licked my own self-inflicted wound and dressed it, taken hold of the black hole around which the galaxy whips the carnival ride of its swirling counterforce. And the event horizon is a moving walkway, is a tantalizing line. Enter now as a swimmer enters wading into the great chrome undulation of the late day ocean. It's boundless thought, the ashen ruminative sky, the heavy sun, both scarlet and obscure. It melts, reconstitutes, drags out its swell and wane, snags at the roughening chop, the weedy waves, and finally fades. Enter. The world has ended. There's no more skin in the game. No more corporeal juice in the algorithm. But the body was always impolite, a feral animal spraying its stink on the furniture, barking its agonies and delights. Enter ghost into the anthem's chorus. You're vacant and aching counterpoint, the vowels of its voiceless known, what is known but not thought, felt but not formed to thought. Enter as agitated air, as flustered moths, as a word shaped in the aperture of a gaping mouth. Enter apparitions of imperiled empire, no air apparent, apportioned and partitioned, breathless and late as the present enters and re-enters and re-enters the present tense. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jenya. Uh, Jen, I wonder if you could just scroll up one page to show, because there is art that goes with us and it's such so nice and that the poem took the whole page. I don't have anything to say about it. I just thought people should see yes. an image. Well, Alyssa Fanny. Yes. Yeah, beautiful uh, pencil, uh, graphite drawings, really intricate and involved and landscape and abstract to beautiful. Yeah, I love her work. And thank well, you, Jenya, beautifully. Jenya, that was really great. Thank yeah, you. Paired, yeah. Okay, so next is Rosanna Warren. And I just want to remind you, Jennifer, that I'll be paired with Rohan. Uh, yes, and I'll... Well, but, yeah, you could go last. Yeah, that's fine. And, that's a, fine. Nice, a nice way to end the- That's uh... perfect. Yes. Thank you. Oops, uh, there we go. Um, why don't I just say a tiny bit about the image and then Rosanna, you can take it away. Um, I did a, project where um, at the Tenement Museum in New York City, a big installation back in the about 2008 or nine. And Martha Collins, the image that accompanies your poem was also a drawing that I, preparatory drawing for that project. Um, one of the things we had to do was that really the only thing was we were supposed to go to a language school and just, I, I didn't even tell us what to do at the language school, but we met all this incredible array of immigrants every culture you can imagine. And many of them invited us to their workplaces or their houses. And this uh, piece, which is called, really it's called Seraphin on Utica. I kind of forgot that when I gave Jen the name, but was there was a Mexican immigrant, undocumented immigrant from, who had a, who worked all night and all day he both slept and he took us to his apartment and not only did he, this really was one room and not only did he sleep there, but he had all the phonetic um, images of letter of English letters up in charts on his wall. So when he was awake, he could memorize English 
sounds. And his wife and daughter lived in Mexico. He hadn't seen them in four years. He worked all night in order to make enough to send back to his family in Mexico. And he struck me, the name Seraphin just seemed, it seemed like he was an angel. It was a very appropriate name. And so I made this drawing, which is of course, Utica Avenue is a great big long flat avenue with many, many, many streetlights. But um, I felt that it fit Rosanna's poem because the children in the dream in the poem are also angels and victims of our terrible immigration policy. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jennifer. This is an extraordinary collection. Catherine and I have been friends for decades and I've been watching her art grow for decades. So I, I love that our, our works are paired here. I also wanted to show you the cover of this book, So Forth. If you can see, the painting is by another friend of mine, the painter Bunny Harvey, and the chain link fence that you can sort of see in her painting um, is her painting is called Survival Tactics, which also seems hum hor horrendously appropriate to everything that's happening. Uh, this poem is dated and so thematically clear it needs, I think, no explanation. 4th of July, 2018. A quilt of heat smothers the woods, the mountain, the rickety house. At 4 a.m., moonlight silvers the window frame. Police state, police state, the dream declares, twisting damp sheets. Dawn filters into the moon meadow. Birds explode in whistles and coloratura. The dream wakes and stutters. Camps, children in camps as the sky turns powdery white. Still the heat, the smolder muffles each word, muffles the law in a cadmium yellow day. How slowly we move, how slowly our thoughts ooze out. The children are hidden deep in the folds of heat. The dream has gone back to sleep and the trees short of breath gesture vaguely, exhausted women with ponderous bathrobe sleeves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna, that was beautiful. Thank you. Next is Rowan Ricardo Phillips presented by Anna Bearsome. Well, I'll first um, speak a little bit about my work and you'll forgive me, I have a pre-written prepared kind of artist statement just uh, for the sake of um, expediency because it's a little bit um, uh, intricate and involved. And so uh, uh, you'll indulge me, please. <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, but then I would like to read uh, Rowan's poem because it's so beautiful and I really, love this this pairing um and rowan wrote this poem for this composition for these uh blue compositions uh so um i'm an in interdisciplinary artist inventor and educator who works across a variety of mediums and platforms my work embodies infinitely permutable forms performance sound text images video and books the objective of my work is to develop and expand the languages of form, color, light, sound, text, and context using their intrinsic physical, metaphysical, and relational properties to make concrete and ephemeral phenomena. I create intimate artifacts, installations, images, drawings, documents, and experiences. I have a social practice which is guided by my principles for social justice. I want to help create systemic political and social change through a grassroots networked approach to empowering communities and individuals. I'm interested in creating uh, an intersectional multidisciplinary forum for discourse, education, art, culture, politics, technology, and ecology. Um, this uh, blue composition here, which is a light composition from 2020, um, 
is uh, part of a much larger project that I've been working on since 2014. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about that briefly. So I'm engaged in exploring the physics of light and color using lenses, a photon trap or a light trap, a camera and other digital means, as well as folded planes of material. Um, this came about through many nights observing the behavior of light and finding out first that I could see individual photons or light emissions in complete darkness with the unassisted eye. And further, I discovered I could trap these light emanations or photons. This was a first in both art and science. And these findings were later confirmed by teams of physicists months and years after my successful des desktop exper experiments. I found this news very gratifying as it supported my findings. And in fact, the methods that they used were surprisingly similar to mine, my homemade uh, photon trap, for instance, and my desktop practice, which was rather involved and, and, and very rigorous, but uh, without a, a multi-million dollar budget, of course. Uh, I discovered an infinite tessellation pattern, pat, uh, pattern, an infinite tessellation pattern during my work on one of my patents, uh, and I observed individual photon emissions uh, as well. And then I created this trap and I tracked them. So I invented a trap. Um, I raise these important first because I feel artists are creative visionaries who can bring about new ideas, inventions, tools, and technology that will change the future. Uh, my praxis is part meditation, exploration, and experimentation. To sit in the dark and observe these smallest constituent units of matter or photons, which Einstein called light packets, um, and contemplate the reality that we are composed of this material, the same material, which is light. Um, our thoughts and our consciousness are made of light, uh, which has been proven by physicists. You know, we, we have these uh, mental synapses. Uh, which are in fact light emanations. So our consciousness, very consciousness is comprised of light. Our nervous system and our brain synapses are powered by light. We are biophotonic beings held together in these bodies made of waves and particles. My process involves folded planes of tessellated materials to create higher dimensional forms, then layering on top of them my printed light and color experiments to create higher dimensional color and forms, which are interactive and multivalent. These colors and geometries are further organized by a mathematical set to arrive at an aesthetic embodiment of my work using color and pattern to create a pleasing, even beautiful sensation to the eye. My intention is to convey an existential and aesthetic meditation on the nature of existence using physics and metaphysics. So I will read uh, this poem. Let's see if I can see it. Oh, I have it, I have it in the book here, so. Um, Page 100. The wall by Rowan Ricardo Phillips. The wall. The human being can't survive in the sky or in the sea. Our relation to blue revolves around this contretemps that blue is the song of our separation from the world and the song of our inherent place within it. The green and broken splotches. The wall. I wish I could make this seem more beautiful. But what could possibly be more beautiful than a song you can't outlive? Like when I first heard the lark ascending in a bowl of Egyptian blue, the smoke from the trees caroling up the blue chrome, a kind of unsequestered confidence in the bronze horizon. It's massy swagger, part physics, part faith, part universal blue. Okay, thank you. I, I actually, I added a word. So <laughs> this is what happens when the, when the poet does not read it, but rather someone else does. But um, thank you. It was fun. I just wanted to point out, and it was beautifully read, I thought. It's an amazing poem. And, Ro and Rowan actually 
wrote these poems in response to Anna's images. He wrote to me, I sent, as you all know, I sent out a letter saying, if you have any artists that you want to collaborate with, feel free, et cetera. And he wrote back and said, no, I would love some images. Send me some images and I'll write poems in response. So the three poems in here were all written after I sent Anna's images to Rowan. Could, could we look at a couple of the other, other, other poems and images? I won't read anymore, <laughs> but um, yeah, just to, uh, Get a sense of them, yeah. So it's a it's really quite an honor to to have um, this pairing for me. Um, These are the two, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So yeah. that's it, isn't it? Unless we have, does anyone want to engage in discussion, discourse? I have questions I could ask. How are we feeling? Is everyone feeling good? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Good. Good. Why well, well, have some questions? I mean, we could we could continue for a little while longer. Who you know, and those of you who want to uh, continue can stay, and those of you who need to uh, go elsewhere can do that as well. Uh, what do you think, Catherine and Jennifer? How are you feeling? Great. Good. That's fine. I think as long as people know they don't have to stay, but if people yeah. fifteen minutes of conversation any thoughts about any of this work or about I don't know the world <laughs> or anything that <laughs> springing to mind by this whole afternoon of such a rich diet um, you know have, please just raise your hand or somehow unmute yourself and I, no. I, I have a request uh, I, I thought this was probably going to go up but I would really love to see uh, what Catherine paired with my poem Yes, one moment. Thank you. It's way at the end, Jen. It's one of the very last. Yes. Um, I couldn't. Uh, there. It is. there. Yeah. Oh, no. Back, back. You went too far. There. That's oh. It. So uh -huh. I, I just thought it fit your theme of threads and light and so on. Oh, that's beautiful. Would you like to read that poem? It would be. Fantastic, if you could, Martha. It's the same poem I read before. I, oh. I should say something about this. The reason I wanted to show the, the cover, um, it took us six months to get permission to use uh, that Dori Salcedo piece. Uh, we had a mock cover for the catalog before mm -hmm. the book came out. And this, in the meantime, Catherine had, had accepted that poem and I said, well, I don't think you can get permission because we couldn't. Mm -hmm. And three days before the book was suppo supposed to go to press, we got permission. So they had to quickly redesign the book cover and so forth, so. Well, maybe uh, in a future issue of this book, we can use Doris's image if she- You're permits. gonna have to get permission and it'll That'll take, take six, six months, months and maybe it'll take six months. <laughs> Unless you want to use the cover. Uh, so this is just one of, it's a, it's a sequence of 50 some, 55 poems I addressed to my husband after he died. And they're now compiled in a, in a book, in a book of- okay. Yeah, the book that you saw the cover of oh, later yes. because- Can you, do you have it there? Could I see that again? Can you hold that up for us to see it? Uh, see it, it won, yes. It won a major award too, Martha. If you're not too shy, you could tell us. Uh, yeah, it, uh, the book won the William Carlos Williams Award wow. um, uh, this year, just this year. Um, Congrats. Thank you. Okay, the, the yes. poem again. I want to make you a morning shirt, a beautiful thing like the artist made for the murdered young men. But this would be for me, for us, with traces of lost thread by thread, not to manage grief, but needle by needle inserted raw in the center of our lives to appear and disappear the absent almost within, but not to touch. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for showing me the, the work, Catherine, that's lovely. It's really lovely. And uh, where, where can we find your book? Is it uh, it's published by the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, um, I can put in 
Yeah, just share share a link with us if you can. I guess I kind of have to make yeah. that. Um, okay. Um, well. Go ahead, whatever anybody's wanting to do. I seem to be not getting messages to everyone. Okay. Um, Would anyone else like to read another poem? I would just wanted to suggest that Rosanna has a new book. You could put that in the chat, Rosanna, um, how we can get hold of that, although I already have a copy, but it's a wonderful book. It's one really fabulous. Uh, anybody else who has books or events that they want to let us know about, just put in the chat. Oh, yes, Tina. Thanks. Yeah, I will. Yes. It's a tough year to have a book come out. Ah, yes, well, I... <laughs> You know, I'm happy to use Battery Journal as a platform for all of you to promote your work. So it is actually a really nice platform for that. Um, and I, I sent a letter inviting all of you uh, to, to do so. But of course, we, there'll be follow up and more, uh, more information, more opportunities to present your work as well. So Heather, I think uh, if I could say, I, I, I'm not so good with chat. It seems to have gone to just one person, David Rich. I don't know how to change that. Scroll it says direct, up. what? Scroll up uh, where it says two. There's a list of everybody. It says yeah. everyone. Scroll all the way up and it will say everyone. Yes, but then I don't see where to add a, a message. Click on everyone. I, actually, Click it's on. the drop menu that will be next to the person. Oh, I see. Now here it is. Person. Okay, thanks. Yep. And Heather, wherever you are, put your book I'm in. Here. Put no, in your book. Um, okay. I don't want to. We're kind of way ahead of me. Heather. I can't even find anything to scroll up on. Oh, it just disappeared. Whoa, okay. gosh, this is just awful. <laughs> okay. It's it. okay. It me, you know? okay. I hate, I, I can't make it work, but the book yeah. is called So Forth and published by Norton in 2020. Bravo. <laughs> If if you if you send me that information, I could I could make that um, a, sort of a post on the journal if you like. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank I invite, you. I invite all of you to 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 do that. I'd like to sort of start to really cultivate uh, an events page and also a um, suggested reading page or suggested books. So yeah, please do. Martha Collins, I put a link to your book in the chat. Oh, great. From uh, bookshop.org. Uh, uh, wait a minute, where is it? Uh, there's a link I, that goes bookshop.org. Oh, oh bookshop yes. is way better. And I'm going to put, I started to put Amazon. I'm going to put uh, also the Pittsburgh link. Great. Uh, Thank you. In a minute. <laughs> when I get rid of this. There we go. Um, and Anna, I'd like to add an interest in your artist statement. Is it possible to get a copy of that? Oh, uh, sure. Yes. Yes, I could send that to you. Yes. Sorry. Me, me, me too, please, because I actually put that in the chat. Yes, I'm building on Monica's comment, and I realized I wanted that as well. <laughs> sure, I, I'm happy to send that along to both of you. Thank, Thank you, you for your interest. Thank you. Send to the chat. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. I'll just uh, put forth a few questions. Um, so how has your work been affected by the pandemic and quarantine? Is it open to everyone? <laughs> <laughs> all right, since I'm unmuted, um, I have written almost not at all. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote one poem uh, during the whole pandemic. I had other things to work on, including translations. Um, but that's just sort of the nature of things for me. And I think, um, I never think about having writer's block, but there are times when taking in is a part of the creative process. And that's really what I've been doing for all these very quiet months. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I have a somewhat similar experience. I mean, first of all, I just feel like time has been warped into, um, you know, it's been nine months and yeah, I, I guess, but it also feels both very short and even longer than nine months at the same time. Um, and it's interesting because um, Heather, Heather Debro, yes. I, I loved your 
your when when you, you the title I think of your your poem instead of saying all passengers must control their baggage was yeah, it yeah, I said all you time. Said, but yes, you said first time. must control their poems and I yes. just loved it so <laughs> wasn't much. that wonderful yes it was <laughs> it was but Very here's my slip of the tongue <laughs> I loved it but here's the thing just the other day I said to to my husband Peter Dudek who was part of um uh, the gathering yesterday, I said that I feel like the last, the pandemic has been like literally being on a flight that mm -hmm. is just circling and we can't <laughs> land because the airport is busy or something. And it just feels this way, you know, like we're, we're almost there, but we're not, and we can't do anything and we can't get up and we can't go to the bathroom and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So there, there's like we're in this 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 flight that just doesn't end. It doesn't doesn't land. It's been very strange. Yep. Right. David? Yeah, I also get the feeling that this time is really concentrated and really intense, and we're feeling the sadness and the struggle and the political bullshit and everything so powerfully at this time. At the same time that we're trying to keep things real basic and simple regarding money and exposure to people, and, you know. So everything, we live and work in one space. So the intensity is the tragedies and the unnecessary bullshit of this time is so palpable every day. And yet, at the same time, the work resonates with the shit we've been trying to do our whole lives in terms of create a viable little pocket of some kind of cultural resistance or some kind of psychological space where we can stay attuned to work at a at a deeper level it, it's it's incredibly powerful and I, I talk to my mom every day long conversations on the phone she's been in a very isolated situation in a senior living place in Chicago and these long long phone conversations are like a lifeline for her and they are for me too because she always sets me right. You know, she calls with some outrage about what Trump and the Republicans are up to. Just fucking outrage. You know, we talk for half an hour about war crimes and the Nuremberg trials. And then we talk about deep appreciation for all the good people in our lives and communities that are doing cool stuff. And then she'll say, Okay, well, you better get back to that painting now. And I say, on it, boss. And we laugh and hang up. And then half an hour later, she forgets that she calls and she calls again. We have a totally different great conversation. That's great. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that story. That's fantastic. That's beautiful. I too have started talking to my parents much more so I think this time in some ways and I won't digress but it can be it's very clarifying uh in in a, in a way um mm -hmm. and it helps one to really sort of prioritize mm -hmm. um anyone else want to answer that question I have one more question that I could ask or actually it, I have more than that but can I respond to that question yeah uh, like, like, like David um I, I just lost my, you didn't lose your, your mother, but I just lost my father a couple months ago. And uh, although it's, it's kind of a personal tragedy, it's, it's amongst so many things that happened to so many people at this time that it's almost uh, a norm. <laughs> and and it's, it's not a norm, but it's, uh, I think in this time we're, we're just, forced to uh, either deny what's happening or accept what's happening. And, and to accept it, I think it forces, 
forces us to go inward and and uh and 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 i feel in in listening to the poems and seeing the art and stuff our own inner logic that we ultimately just have to trust and it guides us and it's a, a really a strange realm to a certain degree and, and it seems that the spirit and, and just my experience with my father and seeing that 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 past that moment of life to death uh you you really did get the sense of the spirit and the body and the difference between those two and um and, and hearing it in the form of poetry or or artworks and everyone reckons with it in a different way but it's beautiful to to hear in someone's poem you know uh just the observations that they make that take us out of we use our everyday, but we transcend our everyday through our mediums. And, and, it, and we enable each other to, to make that transition. That, that's what we offer culture, I think. And, and it's, um, it, it's beautiful to be able to do that in so many other uh, experiences brought about by other artists and poets. May I answer as well? Yeah. As the, po as the poets here know, there's a form called the corona, which is a series of sonnets linked in particular ways. I wrote a corona very early on. I was inordinately proud of myself for thinking of that. And then I discovered that other people had written coronas too about the same corona. But I still am glad I did it. And I've been writing a lot of poems about both this type of illness and other types of illness. But the other effect on me has been to remind me yet again how for all the differences among we poets and artists, we are probably alike in that most or all of us share some basic political analyses. We may or may not think you should have a military leader as opposed to that um, by the person I greatly respect, uh, President-elect Biden put one in, but in very important ways we share a lot and what's happened reminds me how many people there are in the culture who see things very differently. If you look at the percentage who voted for Trump, who supported the initiative to overturn the election, it's quite upsetting. And also as a teacher, I'm still working full time. I realize I have to be careful to show respect for the fact that many of my students have values that I don't respect at all on these subjects. Mm. Oh, interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like to talk. Dina, would you like to respond to any of this, the, that question or? Well, I, I found that I have been writing because I have a writer's group and they give me a deadline, but also that I usually keep in a file all the stuff I want to put in a poem someday. And that file is very skimpy lately. It's, um, I don't have a lot of new experiences because I'm not going anywhere. I'm not driving anywhere. I'm not even, you know, doing new news stories that I would usually be doing that would give me fodder for poems. So I'm writing more, but with less material. But in stillness is dance. Right. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Right. Ron, did you have something to say? Yes, I was thinking, I mean, I have been trying to, um, tr I've been trying to deal with the pandemic in all these different ways. And I started saying, write about the pandemic. Well, I got more than I bargained for. I did get one done. It took me three months. And I've noticed that since then, I can't really write anything else because it almost feels as though the pandemic is everything. Life is in suspended animation, and there are so many comments about the nature of time, our experiences of time, that I felt were absolutely powerful and urgent to be expressed in the poem. But I didn't have the method. I didn't. I couldn't do it, and I realized, well, it's all nonsense. So how do you write nonsense? 
-hmm. And they realized that the only way that I could do it technically was to get a music and a rhythm that reduced things to the level of absurdity, but the imagery had to be something we were familiar with. So that poem is done, but since then I haven't been able to write anything else. Be and the isolation is, I mean, I re I'm so glad for this forum because it makes me feel, my gosh, so many people having similar experiences, but dealing with it in remarkably, I mean, very di distinct ways, but there's this underlying, there's this commonality of um, fear, alienation, hope, love, trust, fury, despair, and uh, I'm very grateful to be in your company. So it's a, it's an inspiration. I know it's today is not forever. Um, this will this too will pass. But, um, so I thank you all for your comments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else want to respond to that question? Gail. going to, um, I didn't know if I was waving goodbye or if I was going to sh share my, my sudden perception when one of us said, it's been nine months and what have we got? And I thought of my first pregnancy and how the baby was overdue. <laughs> and then I thought something came, something will come, but I, I also have not been productive in terms of writing at all. So, uh, and then I wanted to thank everybody for this um, terrific meeting and reading and art sharing. And I hope we meet again like this. Oh, well, we can certainly. I, I fully anticipate that we will. And so not to go out uh, on such a, um, oh, kind of mor morose, <laughs> oh, okay. morose topic. Uh, how about this question, just to wrap things up. Who are your favorite dead poets? <laughs> oh. Impossible. Yeah, impossible. That's impossible. Right. Impossible. Today, tonight? Tonight, today. It could be a it could be several, one or two or three or five. One. And then a, a companion question to that would be, um, uh tell us about a book that you've read recently that's been meaningful and maybe even helpful during this time so those are those are two questions to think about and i invite uh anyone who feels compelled to answer either of those or both questions to share your thoughts with us um in the beginning of the pandemic um when time really kind of ground into the sludge. Um, my husband and I were trying to figure out how to organize our, our life in some meaningful way um, beyond, beyond our work. And we decided that we would read out loud every night. And the first book that we um, committed to is a book that I've read before and loved and was new for him. And that was uh, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. An amazing book, um, yes. An, ama an, an amazing and extraordinary book that also has a very kind of viscous quality in terms of time and timelessness and isolation and the kind of the, the richness of inner life. Um, so I would say that that and all the, the books that followed, we've taken on a lot of projects now where we're reading Moby Dick. You know, we, we've mostly chosen heavy tomes that, that take a long time so that there's something to look forward to and experience together. So um, Magic Mountain and Moby Dick. <laughs> what, a, what a great idea to, yeah. to, to read them out loud too. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. I'll say that we've done the same thing, my partner and I. We, we've been doing it for years, really, uh, but with 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 George Eliot and Joseph Conrad and Tolstoy, but this summer we read Madame Bovary in French, and it was so delicious to appreciate again Flaubert's furious artistry, sentence by sentence, clause by clause, word by word. It it was salvific, and his fury of his hatred 
was also felt salvific, his disgust. Mm. Well, thank you everyone for, for participating in this. Let's do it again. Let's do it again soon. Thank you, Anna.